Okay, good to see everybody tonight. Welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. Uh, please, after the service, I'll be out in the foyer, and I just want a chance to say hello to you and greet you tonight. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to be away last week. I, I was able to take Ashlyn, our daughter, back to the States, to San Francisco, and get her on a plane to Texas, and she's doing uh, much better um, than she was when she got here, and so we're really thankful for that. I went up to Portland and spent a few days with Alex. Some of you remember Alex, one of our summer interns, uh, was here back in the summer, worked with us, and did youth camp and some other things. and. Alex is planning, we hope, to come back next summer for a year and serve alongside of us. And so that's why I went up to Portland to spend some time with him and his family. I got back Friday morning, and it was such a short trip, I, I'm barely jet-lagging, so I think I'm going to stay awake for this sermon. So we'll see how it goes. Andy, thanks for preaching last week. Uh, you did a great job, and thanks for continuing the uh, the theme of looking at what John is trying to teach us about Jesus. I do want to say a word about uh, TIF North. Uh, Krista and I have been over there almost every week, except last Sunday, of course, I was gone, but uh, things are progressing really well and are uh, joining together and coming together. And um, just to give you a little bit of an update, I want to keep our congregations aligned. Um, they're starting a greeter team. Um, that's something that was, has been necessary for uh, them to kind of move forward. And so we got that team off the ground today. And so next week, uh, their greeter team is going to start functioning. Uh, I'm actually going to pre I am actually going to preach the next two Sundays. Steve, is, uh, Steve and his wife, Katie, are going over to the big country for a couple of weeks. And so I'll be preaching. And uh, he's asked me to preach on what, is it, what does it mean to be a part of TIF? And so you guys can be praying for me as I prepare those couple of messages. Some of you are probably thinking, well, I'd like to hear that too. Well, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe you should come over next Sunday and find out what it is because I'm, I'm thinking about it right now. And so anyway, we're going to continue our series in John uh, here next Sunday night. So um, maybe you want to come get double duty. And please remember, we've asked some of you to consider moving over there and joining us at TIF North to help carry the DNA of what it does mean to be TIF uh, over there. And so a few of you have already uh, gone over there, actually. We've already got a, a few people that are, are headed over there. And so some of you may be ready to do that. I'll start preaching over there on a regular basis January 12th, okay? January 12th. That'll be the day when I'm, I'm fully over there on Sunday mornings. So if you're planning on doing that, if you would, just let me know or let one of the other elders know so we can uh, just plan on that transition for you. All right, we are back in John tonight, uh, as always, as we're, we're looking at what John is trying to teach us about Jesus. And what he's trying to teach us is that Jesus can be believed, right? Jesus can be, we can believe in Jesus and we, we believe in Jesus so that we can have life. All right, John wants us to have life in Christ, a full life in Christ. So we come to chapter 7, and uh, it's, it's actually a really interesting uh, breaking point in the narrative that John has been weaving for us. We're going to do something just a little bit different uh, tonight than we have with the other passages that we've looked at, because John is a long chapter. It's 52 verses. And I'm going to focus tonight on the most important part of the chapter. I'll, I'll tell you the whole context of the passage, but I'm just going to focus in on the, the last few verses, actually, verses 37 to 44. So let's read those verses as we begin. It says, on the last and most important day of the festival, okay? Which festival? We're in the festival of booths, okay? And I'll tell you more about that in just a moment, okay? So just stay with me. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. That's a little commentary that John gives on the passage. Okay, He has some 
force or some hindsight because he's writing this later on. When some from the crowd heard these words, they said, this truly is the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Doesn't the scripture say that the Messiah come, comes from David's offspring and from the town of Bethlehem where David lived? So the crowd was divided because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. This is God's holy word, holy and righteous word. All right, let's, let's get back and get some context about what's going on here. Jesus has not only been publicly healing and performing miracles and signs, but remember, he's also speaking. He's telling people things as he goes along. When he speaks, what John has recorded for us, he's challenging his listeners, okay? He is bit by bit, word by word, revealing himself as the Messiah, the one sent from God. Listen, only a lunatic or a madman or a fool or the true Son of God would say the things that he's saying. All right, let me remind you of some of the things that Jesus has said up to this point in the Gospel of John. Okay, let's just take a few of the statements that he's made. Remember he said this, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. Who would say something like that? Only the Son of God or a lunatic. He also said this, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Remember he said that to who? Nicodemus, all right? All right, he also said this, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Who did he say that to? The woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, right? All right, he also said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. You, you can't say something like that, okay, and be a normal person. Only the Son of God can say something like that, all right? He also said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Remember that? Who is this man? He's Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. All right, so now we come to John 7. And we come to another, maybe, his boldest moment yet. Throughout this chapter, John tells us that Jesus is being confronted by unbelief. All right? We're told that I cannot look at those slides. It kind of freaks me out. <laughs> There's a TV up here, by the way, if you didn't know, that shows me what you guys are seeing. And I've never looked at it before while I'm preaching. It kind of messes me up. We are told in verse 5 that not even his brothers believed in him. Did you know that Jesus had brothers and sisters, by the way? His brothers is, of course, a reference to his half-brothers, the natural-born sons of Joseph and Mary. And you can find the reference to that in Mark chapter 3. Um, and there's also another place, I think. It was only after his resurrection that his family actually came to believe in him for who he, who he was and put their faith in him. Then in verse 12, it says, there was much muttering about him among the people. Some people said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. It got so bad that in verse 20, the crowd in Jerusalem actually said, he has a demon. Because of his claim to have come from God the Father, they were seeking to arrest him. Farther down in the chapter, we read that there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, and some of them didn't, but no one could lay their hands on him. Much of this chapter is the response of Jesus to their denial of him. Basically, here's what it boils down to. They brought three charges against Jesus. Okay, so let's look at the three charges against Jesus. First, they asked him this. They said, how can you teach 
with authority because you've never been taught by an official rabbi. And Jesus responds to them by saying this. Here's another crazy statement. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. In other words, he's saying, I don't speak on my own authority or even the authority of any human teacher, but I speak on whose authority? God's. God's authority. All right, there's another charge that came against him. The religious leaders wanted to know, where did you come from, Jesus? Some Jews at the time held to this superstitious belief that when the Messiah came, he would simply appear out of nowhere. Malachi, this comes from Malachi 3.1. They, they misinterpreted the Old Testament and disregarded the other Old Testament prophecies. In John 7.27 it says this, we know where Jesus, where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. Jesus says this, I have not come of my own accord, but he who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I have come from him, and he sent me. Jesus knew exactly where he came from, right? It was their problem, not his. Third, the third charge, when Jesus declared that he would soon depart permanently and none of them could follow him, they says, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the, the diaspora, the Jews that are now spreading out all across the world? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me and where I'm going, you cannot come? All right, so those were the three charges that were brought against Jesus, all right? Now let's get the context of what's going on, okay? We're at the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, there was some significant Old Testament uh, remembrances that the Lord had given the people of Israel. And the Jews were still doing these things to try to keep the law, keep what God had given them. All right? So let me, let me tell you a little bit about the Feast of Tabernacles. Maybe you know about it, maybe you don't. This feast took place in the early fall, immediately after the harvest. It was celebrated after the crops were brought in, like grapes, olives, pomegranates, figs, dates. It typically came five days after atonement. And unlike Passover or the Day of Atonement, which were pretty somber feasts, they were kind of, uh, you know, you, you didn't, they weren't really celebratory feasts. The Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths was very celebratory. It was about relaxing and rejoicing and having a good time. It originally lasted for seven days, but in Leviticus 23, one additional day was added, which brought it to eight days. And during these eight days, here's what happened. You would, if you lived in Jerusalem, remember back then most of the houses were flat, okay? They had flat roofs. You would go up on your roof. You would go out and gather a bunch of like palm leaves and sticks and stuff. I don't know, you know. I don't, uh, when I was a boy, I, I built tree houses. Did anybody here grow up building tree houses? That's like a really cool thing. I have to tell you, okay, and I just triggered a story. <laughs> I, I, I actually had the coolest tree house in the neighborhood because my dad's an engineer, so my dad like built this tree house. It was really awesome. And me and my buddies were out riding around one day, and we found this, um, uh, in, a, in uh, a lot of American neighborhoods, when they put up a uh, telephone pole, they would use these long steel cables to tie the pole to the ground. And the, the cables were used to, to uh, stabilize the pole. So they were, they were probably like, I don't know, 30 yards long, or I don't know, 10, how long is that, 10 meters or something like that? So I, I don't know. I don't know how to convert all that stuff. Well, we found one at a construction site that had been discarded. It had been torn down because of the construction and everything. So we found this really long steel cable. We dragged it back to my house, and we took one end of it, and we took it up to the treehouse, and we tied it up there, and we were gonna we were gonna make a zip line. Talk about a cool treehouse. So we tied one end of it up there, and we tied the other end down to a tree branch at the bottom. We were about nine years old. Okay, so we didn't understand physics or the laws of gravity or 
any speed, any of those things. We just knew we wanted to do something cool. So then we found a piece of iron that had, was like a triangle, and it was my treehouse, so I would go first. <laughs> so I jumped on that wire and immediately rammed myself straight into the ground. <laughs> There was only one of us who attempted it that day. <laughs> After that, we put it away. Anyway, okay, back to the story. So that you would build this little booth on top of your house, and you would live in it for the seven or eight days. It's like camping on your house. Now, Jews would come from all over the region to Jerusalem, just like for the other festivals, and they would build their tabernacles. It was called a tabernacle or a booth, it was basically just a little uh, makeshift house. They would build it on the wall outside of Jerusalem. So everybody's camping, okay? You don't stay in your house. Why would they do this? Does anybody know? What are they remembering? The wilderness wandering, okay? Remember the 40 years in the wilderness? The reason God gave them this, this remembrance, this feast was to remember the wandering in the wilderness. So they were supposed to live in these booths to remember their ancestors who had spent time wandering in the desert for 40 years. So if you were present at, in Jerusalem on this festival, at this festival, it would have been really happy and joyful. I wouldn't have been happy and joyful because I don't like camping. Okay, I would have, I would have maybe, Krista and I would have skipped out. We would have stayed in our house, all right, just to be honest. All right. Everybody else, though, would have stayed in. Now, on the, on the last day of the feast, let me tell you what would happen. Every day, certain things would happen, but on the last day of the feast, some special things would happen. If you were present, you would have gotten in your right hand a branch from several different trees, a myrtle tree, a willow tree, and a palm tree. All right? You would have carried those things. And in your left hand, you would have carried a branch from a lemon tree. All right? And you would have carried those and waved them around. Why? The palm branch represented a symbol of victory, peace, and resilience. The palm symbolized strength and the perseverance of the Israelites in their journey through the wilderness. The myrtle branch represented God's kindness and beauty of his creation, even in the midst of their wanderings. And the willow branch was often found near water, represented their need for continual reliance on God. This was a reminder that God sustained the Israelites in the wilderness. The lemon branch, it's, it's actually a citron, so it's not really a lemon, but it's a citron, symbolized the fruitfulness of the land God was leading them into, the land of promise. One of the priests would then take a golden pitcher, like a water pitcher, pitcher, and lead everybody in a procession from the altar all the way down to the pool of Siloam, all to the accompaniment of flutes and trumpets. And the crowd would be dancing and singing and having a good time. By the way, as I was studying this, it hit me, something hit me for the very first time that I had never thought about. How old is Jesus when this is happening? About 30 years old, right? What had Jesus done for the previous 30 years? He had been a carpenter, okay. He had grown up. Jesus came to these feasts. Jesus had celebrated all these festivals, all these feasts, growing up his entire life. Isn't that interesting? I think that's so cool. All right? So the crowd's making their way down. The priest will fill the water pitcher up with water and make his way back up to the altar. When he gets back up to the altar, two things happen. One of the priests has a pitcher of wine as well, and the other priest takes the pitcher of water, and they pour them onto the altar, and the water runs down to the base of the altar, which is stone. What's the symbolism? What did Moses have to do in the wilderness? He struck the stone, 
and water came forth. Why? Because the people were thirsty, right? They needed water. This happened every morning for seven days, and on the eighth day, it was done seven times in a row. While they were doing this, the people would chant Psalm 113 to 118 out loud. Listen to this. These were the words, the final words they would say. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Please grant us success. He who comes in the name of the Lord is blessed. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. What's that psalm talking about? Who comes in the name of the Lord? Jesus. The symbolic purpose of the water ritual, which was considered the high point of the festival, was to remind the people of the provision of water from God during the time of Israel's wanderings in the wilderness. In fact, the entire festival was to retell the story of desert life during Israel's wanderings in the wilderness. You can read about it in Leviticus 23 if you want to. When the priest would pour the water onto the altar, he would say these words from Isaiah. You will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation, and on that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known his works among the peoples, declare that his name is exalted. It was at that moment that Jesus stood up and said these words. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. Let's not move too fast here and lose the moment of what is happening. Imagine we're having our service right now, and somebody stands up and starts shouting in the middle of our service. What would we all do? Yeah, I would probably be, shh. Interestingly enough, the people, and it seems to include the priests listening to him, consider what he says. What has he said? Think about it. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. What has he done in that statement? I had to think about it for a little while. He has made himself equal with God. He has basically said to the people, I and God are the same. Your thirst was satisfied in the desert by God. Now I am here to satisfy your thirst. The one who believes in me as the scripture has said, what is he referring to as the scripture has said? What scriptures would they have had? The Old Testament, the Torah, the law and the prophets. Okay, they would have had the law and the prophets. And Jesus is saying, these scriptures that told you about me, they have commanded you to believe in me. And if you do, you will have streams of living water flow up from within you. You will never be thirsty again. See what else it says there? If who? Anyone. What did I tell you about the people that he was encountering in this chapter? What were they like? They, were, they wanted to arrest him. Some of them wanted to put him to death eventually. They didn't believe in him. They didn't care about him. They didn't like him. His own brothers rejected him. And Jesus still gives the offer of salvation if anyone believes in me. There's only one requirement for responding to the invitation that Jesus is giving. You know what it is? Thirst. Thirst. Not physical thirst for physical water, but spiritual thirst for spiritual water. 
that begs the question. This is where I want to get to tonight. So let's just pause here for a second. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? When was the last time you experienced true spiritual thirst? What, have you ever thought about this? Why does the scripture over and over again use the metaphor of water? God loves that metaphor. Water. Pure water. Can I share with you just a little bit of medical science? Yes? I'm going to anyway. Okay. Sorry. Did you know that water is the most Pure water is the most efficient means of hydrating the human body. It's better than any other drink. There's not a sports drink that even can compare to it. It replenishes fluids directly without any extra substances that require extra processing. So it gets into your bloodstream quicker than any other liquid you can drink. Every cell in your body relies on water for function. Pure water balances your electrolytes, it aids in nutrient transport, and it facilitates waste removal. It helps maintain your blood volume, it regulates your body temperature, it lubricates your joints. It goes straight to where it's needed without burdening the body. Even mild dehydration can impair your brain function. That's why some of you are, you know, dehydrated. Just kidding. It can affect your mood. It can affect your energy level. Water enhances your mental clarity by improving circulation and oxygen flow to the brain. Juices, soft drinks, sports drinks, bubble tea, contain high sugar levels that actually lead to further dehydration. Did you realize that? All the drinks that you think will actually get you hydrated actually make you more dehydrated. Because sugar, when you drink sugar, something with sugar in it, guess what happens? Your body has to devote resources to your digestive system to process the sugar, which causes the body to lose more water. It also triggers an insulin response, which leads to a blood sugar crash. Okay, we can go on and on and on. Caffeine, caffeinated drinks, and alcohol also have the same effect, okay? Water hydrates your cells and organs efficiently without adding any extra workload. By drinking water, the body focuses on hydration without expending energy on metabolizing anything else. Water is what the body truly needs to effectively quench physical thirst. Hey friends, why did God choose water as the metaphor for Christ? because he's what you need to satisfy your true spiritual thirst. In Jesus' day, there weren't choices. I mean, you walk into 7-Eleven now, and I mean, how many drink choices are there? And in a good 7-Eleven, you've got at least 100 or more drink choices, right? Back in Jesus' day, you had, sometimes you had water, you had wine, and probably juices, I would guess, and other fermented drinks. Certainly, they didn't have access to the medical knowledge that I just shared with you, but they understood the importance of having water, and I guarantee you they understood what it meant to be thirsty better than we understand what it means to be thirsty. But just like them, just like us, people in every time and every age have tried to satisfy their spiritual thirst apart from Christ, right? We try to satisfy it with sex, power, wealth, curiosities, travel, you name it. Just fill in the blank. Let's just spend a minute thinking about this for a second, okay? We're probably, I'm guessing, you and I, we're probably not physically thirsty very often, right? You have a faucet or a water machine or in Taiwan, we've got water machines, you know, around every corner. So if you get 
even the slightest hint of thirst, you've got water accessible to you instantaneously. When were you truly thirsty last? I mean soul thirsty. Have you ever thought about this? Or maybe we're too busy drinking from the world's spigot that we never stopped long enough to consider our spiritual thirst. The world is full of things that promise fulfillment, satisfaction, thirst-quenching satisfaction, success, wealth, pleasure, relationships, entertainment, endless self-improvement. And those things aren't necessarily wrong in themselves, but we look to them as a source of our identity, peace, or purpose, they ultimately fall short. Many people spend their entire lives in pursuit of them, only to realize too late they're still thirsty. Our, let, me, let me break it down into three different areas. Physical, okay, let's talk about that for just a second. Our physical nature pulls us towards shallow solutions that seem to fill our desires. Instead of seeking true inner peace or spiritual wholeness, we turn to things that numb or distract, like food, media, relationships, sex, other pleasures. These things may temporarily quiet the feeling of emptiness that we have, but they can't heal or satisfy our soul's need. In fact, they often do the opposite effect. They intensify our hunger and thirst. There's another area, the enemy, the devil. He's working against us, my friends. And his strategy is actually often like this, to keep us unaware of our need for God by tempting us with good enough solutions. He deceives us into thinking that we're not really in need or that our thirst can be satisfied with things other than God. What, is, what does the Bible tell us Satan is? He's the father of lies. One of his most effective lies is that true fulfillment can be found apart from God. This deception keeps people busy, distracted, and disconnected from our deepest need, their thirst for Christ's life. Many people never realize they're spiritually thirsty because they've so filled their lives with these other substitutes. Even when they do feel a little bit empty or unsatisfied, they have something else to satisfy it with or try to satisfy it with so quickly, they never realize the real connection they're seeking, seeking is with God. So I want to ask you again, when was the last time you were spiritually thirsty? Really thirsty for God. Let's just do something together right now, okay? I'm going to ask you to do something I haven't done in a really long time, so just bear with me. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. I'm not going to, I don't care. I mean, I do care, but, um, you know, you just do what you want to do. I'm going to ask you to just close your eyes. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to call anybody out. Let me just ask you to close your eyes. Picture a cup in your hand. Picture a cup in your hand. What's in that cup? What have you been drinking spiritually? Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. What have you been satisfying your soul with? Ask the Holy Spirit to help you see. Now, what do you need to do about that? For the Christian, what we need to do when we realize something is off in our Christian life is we need to repent. We need to turn. And so when you look at that cup and you see what's inside, if it's not Christ, then you need to repent. You need to say, Jesus, 
I've been seeking satisfaction, soul satisfaction from something else, and it's not you. And I'm sorry. I repent of that, and I ask you to help me pour this cup out so that my cup can be filled with the living water that is Christ. And what did Jesus just say in this passage? If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Hey, friends, you don't have to hunt for it. He's ready to give it to you. He is the living water. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for every person in this room tonight that you would convict us, that you would heal us, that you would help us to look deeply at what we've been trying to satisfy ourselves with. Maybe some of us are actually holding more than one cup. Maybe we're drinking from a multitude of cups that have all kinds of different things in them. And these cups are worthless and not truly satisfying. God, help us to just throw them away and give us the cup of Christ that we could be truly satisfied in him. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you offer us this living water freely. And I pray that we will all find it satisfying. Satisfy our souls, Lord Jesus. We ask this in your name, the name that is above every name, Jesus. Amen.